Our speaker today works with the Institute of Biblical Leadership. That's his full-time job now. He's doing that part-time. He's been an associate pastor, youth pastor, associate pastor, pastor of a church, and now he's helping others. We came in to do a board retreat for our men this weekend. The board, very appreciated. And you know I don't do this very often, but I'm letting him preach in Matthew. Uh, the next passage, go ahead and preach what I normally would have preached. And so, uh, it's like you're like you're an associate pastor, Bible speaker. This my good friend and brother Dave Deeds. I'm glad to have you come ahead, brother, and share what the Lord's given Well, thank you so much. And it's great to be able to be here at uh, Bible Center Church. And uh, it's uh, great to be able to be in southern Louisiana. I uh, told Pastor Gary I had been to. Uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, but that's about the extent of my Louisiana experience, and I know culturally you're going to tell me that may or may not be Louisiana, because <laughs> this is Louisiana. So uh, it's been great to be able to be with uh, the men this weekend. Joel Tetro, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, was with us and uh, just had a great time to, uh, spending some time with, with uh, the guys this weekend, and so... Uh, I, I am humbled to be able to be here and, and to Pastor Gary's point. Uh, I served as lead pastor for seven years at uh, Whitneyville Bible Church. And about two or three years in to it, one of our elders recommended that, you know, it would be good for consistency's sake. If, if you're going to be gone, let just one of us preach the next text. And the first time they suggested that, I kind of got this little, like, twitch going on, because I thought, well, I had already planned to preach that, and if I was gone, you can preach something else, and I'll come back. It's, you, there's, a, there's an ownership that you feel as a pastor as you're laying out a, a, a text of scripture, and so I do appreciate this, and do uh, I do understand uh, some of that uh, angst that, uh, that Pastor Gary was talking about, uh, but yet in the same way, for the congregation, it's great to just continue to move on and move forward, and to to be able to look at the next passage up and to be able to uh, look at what God has uh, for us. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And uh, I love this setup you guys have with the kids. This, this was a brilliant. I told Clyde and Larry that this morning. And you guys have a slew of girls. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but wow. Um, that's, uh, that's a half an group right over there. So um, anyway, just, it's just great to be here. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, I'm, I'm also humbled by the fact that I was telling the guys, it's easy when you're not from around here, and the TV cameras come, and they show all the damage, and then they leave, and in your head, you just think, oh, well, it must be fun, and uh, to realize, I know some of you are still trying to get you back on your feet, and get going, and, and get moving, and so uh, it reminded me of the need to, to pray for you all, and to encourage you all as you continue to trust God. Uh, to sustain you through some difficult times and through some difficult situations. And so uh, that's been kind of a humbling thing this weekend to realize, oh, wait, now everything is back to normal. Even though the, the cameras are gone and the media is gone and everything has gone, you still have lives to put back together. And so it's reminded me to, to pray for you all and to uh, just encourage you as we have opportunity. Well, as Pastor Gary mentioned, we're going to be in the book of Matthew, and, and I appreciate David's uh, putting together the worship this morning and and the song service that has really lent itself to this particular text of Scripture. Matthew uh, chapter 22, we're going to be looking at verses 34 through 40. And uh, this is probably one of the most familiar sections of Scripture in the book of Matthew and the Gospels. As it is dealing with this aspect of loving God and loving others. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Verse 34, it says this, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law 
and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Father, we are indeed so thankful to you for all that you have done for us. What a great reminder this morning to sing about and to think about your love for us. You loved us while we were yet sinners. That's an amazing thing to comprehend, that you would love us proactively. You would love us initially. And then you demonstrated that love to us. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. So God, we thank you for that. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us as we examine this text to be able to be reminded of the need to love you and to love others, but also to be reminded of the balance within that concept. And that, Father, we might not abuse that truth of the need to love you and to love others. So, Father, I pray that you would give us clarity of thought and mind, clarity of uh, being able to process through your word this morning to be able to come to the truths that you have for us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. As Pastor Gary mentioned, I became pastor of Whitneyville Bible Church in 2013, and when I got there... Uh, there was no vision statement, there was no mission statement, there was really nothing that the church had that would say, this is why we're here, this is what we're doing, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And so, in one of the first meetings with our leadership team, I told them, I said, it would be really helpful, at least for me, if nobody else, it would be helpful if we could have some kind of vision statement or some kind of mission statement, just, just to kind of help keep us centered on what God has for us. The guy said, well, if... If you feel like that's important, then you figure out something to say, and we'll go with it. Well, that was an interesting uh, exercise to do, and so I, I kind of thought, well, what if I were to, if I were just to say, why do we exist, and why are we here, and what are we trying to accomplish? What's the simplest thing I could possibly say? Well, the only thing my brain could come to was to go to this text, and we developed as our ministry, as an initial mission statement, was this unconditionally love God and others. That was it. That's all I could come up with to say. That at least gives us something to shoot for. Our church, the church that I pastored, had been through two church splits, a merger, and a fire in the decade before I had come there. We had been through a lot. There had been a lot of chaos and a lot of challenges and a lot of relational issues that had occurred. And the only thing I could think of that would take a group of people who still were at really at the verge of civil war still and to help us move forward was to say you know what how about we just go back to the simplicity of matthew chapter 22 verses 34 through 40 and say this our goal our mission is to unconditionally love god and others let's just start at the very beginning and that's kind of where this text is drawing us to it's where it's focusing our attention to i don't know how pastor gary is typically gone through these sections of scripture, so maybe he's looked at this in a different capacity. I'm just going to kind of work our way through this narrative of, of interaction that's going on, and then we want to draw out some principles, draw out some applications for us as we begin to look at and apply these particular truths of scripture. If you've been tracking along in this particular chapter of Matthew, you know that this is the third time that Christ has been questioned. Seemingly questioned on the same day in a, in a short amount of time. As you look back up to some of the preceding chapters, uh, preceding verses uh, that Pastor Gary, no doubt, has already uh, covered and talked about. You see, starting back up uh, in verse 15, the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. This was all part of a devious plot on their part. Sometimes... It's good to ask questions. And sometimes people ask questions out of a pure heart. Purely just want to know. Purely just want to understand. Just help me understand what is going on here. Other people, have you ever been asked a question by somebody else where you're like, I'm not really sure that you have a pure heart in that question. I feel like you're setting me up for something. You know, your children come and ask you a question sometimes. 
Hey, mom, let me give you this hypothetical situation. And you're like, I don't know that that's really hypothetical. I feel like you're trying to get one ahead of me to then use that against me. Or sometimes as dad, they come and they say, hey, dad, what do you think about this? And if we're not careful as dads, we can just kind of give a quick response. And then we realize, oh, our kids were actually thinking a little bit farther ahead than we were. Trying to pit us against each other or trying to establish some law within the family that then they could use. Well, that's what is happening here. The Pharisees have come to Christ and they're trying to trap him. And so we see that through verse 15 and we see that into verse 23 where the Sadducees come and they are trying to question him. And then we get to verse 34 and it's happening all over again. So verse 34, the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply. They met together to question him again. Okay, the first one didn't work. And the Sadducees didn't work. Let's try it a third time. Let's, let's see if maybe this angle of approach is going to get us the, the result that we're looking for. To try to trap Jesus. Of course, we know and understand the futility of this. Much like we as human beings are futile in a lot of our endeavors that we try to do, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are futile in how they're trying to go about this. But nonetheless, they try. If you weren't here in the last couple of weeks, I'm sure Pastor Gary has mentioned, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are two religious groups of people. The Sadducees are more of the elitists, more of the, the, the higher-powered people, more of the uh, aristocrats, if you will. Uh, they, they tended to be a little bit more wealthy. They tended to hold a little bit more powerful positions. The, the chief priests, the high priests, were Sadducees. So these were kind of the upper elite echelon people. The Pharisees were a little bit more representative of the common person. But they were still engaged in the religious aspects and religious aspects of the law. And they come in verse 34 when they see and they heard that the that the Sadducees had been silenced, this is a chance for the Pharisees to say, well, you know what, if the Sadducees were shut down, maybe, maybe we could come at Christ a little bit differently than we came to him before. And so, verse 35, one of them, an expert in religious law, comes to Jesus. No doubt the Pharisees had had some conversations. No doubt they had said, okay, how, how do we go about this? How, how, do we, how do we make our best effort, make our best attempts at trying to trap Jesus? And so let's get not just some average Joe who really doesn't know what he's talking about, because clearly that's not working. Let's find the cream of the crop. Let's find our best guy we can find. Let's, let's find this religious expert, as the New Living Translation states here. Others will say it's a, it's a lawyer. It's, it's someone who is well-versed in religious law. Let's find the expert, and let's put the expert up against Jesus Christ. This is, this is like we are all in on this move. This is our guy. He's going to answer the, He's going to get Jesus Christ to answer this question. He is going to be able to trap Jesus. So verse 35, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. There is an irony in verse 35. The irony in verse 35 is this. Here is an expert in religious law who is trying to trap Jesus Christ. Either he's not really an expert in religious law from the standpoint of understanding Jesus Christ, or he's the most arrogant person in the world who thinks he can just simply come and he is going to trap Jesus. And so he comes into verse 36 with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Got him. This is the question. If I have one shot at asking any question, this is the question I want to ask. You know, sometimes when we ask questions, we're not always thinking clearly. Sometimes when we're asking questions, we're not always processing through things. I remember when I was in college, I was in doctrines class. It was called themes class for, for those that were studying to be in ministry. And we were, we were coming through the section on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And I typically was one not to ask questions in a class. Just not because I knew all the answers. I just typically wasn't one that 
ask a lot of the questions, but on this particular morning, I decided it was best that I would ask a question. That morning, previous to coming to this class, I had been struggling with a sinus infection, and I had taken some Benadryl that my roommate had, and I hadn't paid attention, and I really wasn't aware that Benadryl makes you sleepy. I didn't know, I just was desperate for medicine. So I grabbed two Benadryl, I popped them in, and I went off to class, sick as a dog, and taking two Benadryl, I decided it was really good to go to doctor's class, because that's the time you want to not be with it. And so I was, at the time I was dating, who is now my wife, we were dating, and she was sitting next to me, and we were sitting near the front row, and the teacher was talking about the virgin birth. And you know how it is when somebody's talking, and it's like, fingernails on a chalkboard, you just kind of want them to shut up and stop talking, and your brain is not really engaged, and that's really where I was. I was in the fog, he was annoying me because he was talking, I should have been home in bed, but there I was in class. And he's talking about the virgin birth, and so I raised my hand, and of course my wife, my girlfriend at the time, looked at me like, oh, okay, Dave's going to ask you a question. So the teacher stopped, and it's a room of probably 40 guys, and he said, Dave, do you have a question? I said, yes, I have a question. I said, Dr. Nunes, or Dr. Schneider, rather, I said, what is so important about the virgin birth? Aren't we all born virgins? I don't understand this. And he looked at me with a look I will never forget of like, what planet have you just stepped on? And I thought to myself, why is he looking at me? That was a legitimate question. Like, that, he was annoying me with what he was talking about. I didn't understand it. I'm going to ask it. And so I, I listened to him, his response, and I was kind of like, that was a weird response. And, and so I, I raised my hand again. And my wife now, who's my girlfriend then, she, she elbows me. And she says, shut up. Just shut up. And I looked at her and I said, no, this, this is very important. And I repeated the question again to the teacher. What is so important about the virgin birth? Aren't we all born virgins? And my teacher looked at me and he said, you must be talking about cows. Let's move on. And I was more confused at that point than I had been at the beginning. I'm like, I'm not talking about cows. I was so confused. I was not in my right mind. I think the lawyer was in his right mind. But the reality was he was in his arrogance of being so versed that the religious law had missed the entirety of who Jesus Christ was. And missed the entirety of the reality of the question that he is posing to him. So yes, he's a religious expert, he's a religious expert in the law, and he's coming to Christ in verse 36 and says, this, if I ever never have another chance to ask another question, this is the most important question I could ask. And so he poses this question to Christ. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? We have to ask the question, why was this the question he asked? Well, no doubt what he wanted to do was to trap Jesus into somehow giving precedent to one law, one command over another one. If Christ could somehow look at the Ten Commandments and say, this one is the most important out of all of them, they could begin to trap him, to begin to just say, we've got some evidence against you. We, we've got some proof that you really don't know what you're talking about. We know that the Ten Commandments, the law was, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto me any graven images. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath day to make it holy. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. Which one of those is the most important one? This is our question. We're going to trap him. We're going to get him. We're going to finally be able to arrest him for the heresy that he's going to commit. And as always is the case with Jesus Christ, if you ever wanted to do a fascinating study, go through the Gospels, look at the questions that are asked to Christ, and look at his responses. Christ never takes the bait. He never takes the bait of the question. No matter who's asking him the question, when Satan tempts him, Christ doesn't take the bait. 
When the Pharisees question him, he doesn't take the bait. He is wise, he is smart, he is strategic in his responses back to people. And oftentimes, it is short, simple responses that quickly put people into their place in a gracious manner. But look at what Christ's response is. Jesus replied, I'm not going to tell you what the most important commandment is. I'm not going to tell you what one ranks above the other ones of the law. But I'm actually going to go deeper. And I'm going to present to you something that you probably haven't thought about, Mr. Religious Law Expert. So verse 37, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second, verse 39, is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. See, the lawyer, the religious expert, was trying to trap Jesus into looking at Okay, about the Ten Commandments in the law, which one, how would you rank these? Would you rank these in some capacity and say, well, you know, maybe number one is the most important one. You know, you can follow, you know, two through ten, but make sure you follow number one. Or maybe Christ is going to come back and say, well, you know, you know what, number six, don't murder. That's the most important one. The other ones, you know, well, you can cover it a little bit and you could, you could, you could have some adultery. You could do some of these other things, but make sure you don't do this. And Christ doesn't even respond to the Ten Commandments at all. Christ doesn't get into some kind of crazy theological debate and argument with the guy. He doesn't go and begin to wax eloquent. Christ simply responds with two statements. Let me tell you what the most important commandment is. It's this. It's the Shema. Mark records for us that Christ is using the Shema in his response. Matthew doesn't record that here. But it's here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And this is what you must do. The very thing that that religious expert would have recited on a regular basis and would have been so familiar with and would have understood like mindless repetition, going through the motions. Christ says, let's actually bring it back to that. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first commandment. And then he says in verse 39, the second one is equally important to it. Love your neighbor <coughs> as yourself. So here's God's response. It was actually in the very first song, video song that David played this morning. Loving God and loving people. And there's a statement in that song where he talks about, we kind of get to the point where we're tired of checking boxes. And we actually begin to realize that one of the most important things we can do is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. There are people who will fill chairs and pews across America today in churches who are simply checking a box, who in reality have learned to despise the very God they are supposed to be loving. Because to them, a relationship with him is nothing more than going through motions, checking boxes, and making sure they look good in front of other people. The religious expert of the law was simply saying, okay, here's the Ten Commandments. Which one is the most important one? Which one should we really focus on the most? Let's just mindlessly keep these things. Let's mindlessly repeat the Shema. Let's mindlessly go through the motions. And if one fell response, Christ kind of grabs his attention and graciously turns it back around on him and says, you know what? How about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Can you imagine the response of that religious expert? Can you imagine the response as he, as he just kind of turns and quietly accepts what Christ has just said? In a, in a very gracious, humbling manner, Christ has communicated to this man. It's not about checking your boxes. It's not about performing in a physical sense in front of everybody so they can see you 
It's about saying this, in my heart, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and I love my neighbor as myself. I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in church all my life. My parents were saved right before my parents got married. My dad was saved. He was a, a Vietnam veteran and got saved before he married my mom, and they began to go to church. And so when I was born, that's what we did. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we were in church. And I remember when I was little, probably five or six, there was a man, an old man in my mind, he was old, he might have been 60, I don't know, but as a kid, he was really old, Mr. Skidmore. And every day I came to church, Mr. Skidmore would see me and he would say, hello, neighbor. And I thought, why does that man call me neighbor? He doesn't live next to me. I thought he was the weirdest person in the world. Why does Mr. Skidmore always say, hello, neighbor? Well, as I got older, I realized, you know what, maybe Mr. Skidmore actually lived in a reality that I was too young and immature to live in. The fact that my neighbor wasn't the person who physically lived next door to me. Scripture's going to point that out. He points that out with the story of the Good Samaritan. Who's your neighbor? Who's the one you're supposed to love? It's, it's people that we engage with. It's people that we, that we live with. It's people that we minister with. It's people that we have a life together with. Romans 13, I appreciate the verses that, that David put up this morning. They lend themselves to this text. But Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 says this, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You say, oh, that's nice. Can I pick and choose who my neighbors are then? If I, if I have to, if the, if the greatest commandment is to love God, well, I can love God. I mean, that's not hard. I mean, well, sometimes it's a struggle because I look around and see things that God allows, and I'm like, how can a loving God do that? But... I could kind of get over that and say, okay, I can look at the positive things about God and I can love him much easier than I can love somebody else. But can I pick and choose who my neighbor is? The reality is no, you actually can't pick and choose who your neighbor is. Our neighbor is whoever God in his will allows to come into our lives. And that's who God desires for us to love. And sometimes it's difficult to love those people who are in our lives. It's difficult for us to, to love the unlovely and to love the annoying and to love the people who frustrate us and to, to love those people that, quite honestly, just irritate us. Maybe those people are within your own family. I don't know. The fact of the matter is, where Christ is communicating to this religious expert of the law, he says this, First of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So what's the point of this, the significance of Christ's response? It's this. He lets us know that it isn't actually about grading the Ten Commandments. It's not about uh, assigning some sort of hierarchy to the Ten Commandments, but it is rather a deeper issue. And that is about loving God and loving others. That is what allows us to fulfill the law as we're thinking about the fulfillment of what Christ expects out of us. It is loving God and loving others. <clears throat> but in the time we have left, I want us to take this just a bit further and think about this for another minute as we think about the reality of this particular statement. Because I think if we were to go out into Luling and I'm going to mispronounce all your words around here, New Orleans, if we were to go out into this area, and we were, as Bible Center Church, to say we should love God and we should love others, probably people would say, you know what, that's, that's nice. That's good. Even people who aren't saved, people who don't know Christ, people who don't go to church, if we were to shoot that message out to say let's love God and love others, well, that resonates with people, especially the love others. But let's make sure that we have some boundaries put around 
these two statements. Because here's what happens. I grew up in a particular church setting that would have said, you know what, if you love God, you will live a certain way. You will make sure that you wear certain clothes. You will make sure that you do certain things. You will make sure that you put your nose down, if you will, on the other people who don't do those things. You basically, what will happen if you love God and with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you are going to be a super holy, righteous person. And it's justifiable in our minds to be con condescending, condemning of other people who don't hold the same kind of standard that you do. That would be the type of church that I grew up in. <laughs> what happens is the holiness of God gets hijacked and it gets weaponized against people to say, if you truly love God, then you're going to live this holy life that is almost this elitism that says we have it better than everybody else and we are better than everybody else. We're just like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And we begin to look down on each other. So on one hand, if we're not careful, we can say, you know what, we are actually God. We actually determine what's right and wrong. We actually are the standard because look at, we are so holy because we love God so much. That's one extreme that can come out of this. The other extreme that can come out of this is this. Well, we should just love everyone. Let's not say anything bad about anyone. Let's not take a stand for anything because that's what love is in our mind. Love just says everything goes. So we can come out of a message like this, even at Bible Center Church, and say, oh, okay, love God and love others, so... Uh, we don't, we don't want to do this, but we don't want to do that. So where are we supposed to land? How do we find the balance within the notion of loving God and loving others? Because on one hand, it is not the liberty to say, I am holy and you are not, and I am your judge and you stand accountable to me, because that is not true. On the other hand, it's not okay to say love says everything goes and everything's permissible, because that is not true. Christ was not communicating to us these extremes. So what is Christ communicating to us? There are two different verses that we want to focus our attention on as we think about as, as the Apostle Paul is going to give us some, some clarity to some of these things, as he's going to give us some explanation to some of these things, to say, how do we balance the application of loving God and loving others? On one hand, we don't want to become the holier-than-thou people who are condescending, looking down on everyone else. And on the other hand, we don't want to be the people who says, well, I guess love just says everything goes. And we have no voice, we have no say, we just have to accept. Where do we come to the middle ground within this process? I would say there are two things to remember. First of all, love motivates us. We must be motivated by love. This is what the point that Christ was trying to make to us. On this, on these two commandments, the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself, on these two commandments hang or depend all the law and the prophets. That's the motivation for how we live and how we function. If I am not motivated by love, it's going to be a check box that I'm going through. Oh, went to church, didn't swear didn't covet, didn't do this. I'm just going through the motions. And after a while of going through the motions, I kind of get fed up with going through the motions. And so I'm just done. What motivates us? It has to be rooted in the love that we have for God and the love that we have for others. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. It's actually the Apostle John speaking here. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. He says this in verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. 
This is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So there is a motivation of love that has to drive us. It has to move us. Why do I love someone else that I attend church with at Bible Center Church? I'm guessing that not everyone that goes to Bible Center Church is the most lovable person that's ever existed. I'm sure those people aren't here because anybody here is just lovable all the time in all situations. I'm not always lovable all the time in all situations. But what motivates us to love one another? It is our love for God. It is displaying the love that God has shown us. He loved us, remember, when we were sinners. He loved us when we were unlovely. He loved us when we were violating his holiness when we were violating his word he loved us so love is what motivates us it's unconditional we don't love people if they do certain things can you imagine if pastor gary got up here and said you know what i love everyone at bible center church who shows up to church could you imagine like how would that go over well i guess i better show up to church otherwise pastor gary might not love me Kind of weird that's a weird kind of love but that's the kind of stipulations we can put on people if we're not careful love is unconditional say you know what i'm going to love you because christ's love for me was unconditional i'm going to love you proactively i don't wait for you to love me i need to show that love to you because that's what christ did he showed his love to us first while we were still sinners and so it is love for god that motivates us that's the drive. Not because Pastor Gary said, you know what would be really great if Bible Center Church if people love one another. <sighs> Fine. I guess I'll love that person over there because Pastor Gary said I had to. Pastor Gary shouldn't be your motivation. What should be your motivation? You know what? Look at how God has loved me. And I want to demonstrate that love to other people. That's the motivation. But there's a second aspect of this. And that second aspect is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. If all we were to have was the book of 1 John, talking about loving one another, that would give us one perspective. But look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, what will we do? We will speak the truth in love. 
growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Verse 15 is a very important verse within this section of Scripture. Because as Paul is addressing this issue of God has given to the church leaders, apostles and teachers and pastors, and he has given to the body these leaders who will help to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. And, and that work of the ministry is going to help produce maturity in the lives of people. And that maturity displays itself by not being tricked by people who are trying to deceive us, but that maturity is demonstrated in love which has discernment. The message of the world today is this, you must love me, and by that I mean, you must fully endorse anything I want to do. That's the message of the world. D.A. Carson, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, wrote a book entitled, The, um, I just lost the title, The Intolerance of Tolerance. And 10 years ago, the professor at Trinity Seminary wrote the book, The Intolerance of Tolerance, in which he made this argument. The world's philosophy is not okay with you being okay with them existing. The world's philosophy mandates you accept it and endorse it and promote it. And what Christianity across America is being bombarded with today is this idea that says, it's not okay that we just allow other people to exist out there. No, no, that's not okay. What we have to do is say, not only do we say it can exist, but we actually accept it, we endorse it, we promote it, and we champion it. And if you don't do that, then you're not loving. And there's a lot of Christians who are running around this country scared to death that they aren't somehow championing something they know is contrary to God's word, but they are so afraid of the societal pressures that they are unwilling to take a stand in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 4, which says this, we speak the truth in love. <laughs> American Christianity is being bombarded today with the idea of will we stand for truth and how do we stand for truth and still be loving when the world tells us repeatedly the only definition of love is that you become a champion for the things that violate scripture. And now Christians are in a quandary. Well, I say something about this. I might be canceled. If I say something about this, I might be shut down. If I say something about this, I'll lose my job. And Paul is trying to point out to us as believers in Ephesians chapter 4 saying, yes, we are to be motivated by love and we are to love one another and we are to, to be unconditional and proactive and balanced in that love. But Paul is also saying, listen, not only does love motivate us, but love constrains us. <clears throat> to say it is the love of God that constrains me from being a champion for something that violates his character and who he is. And there are churches all across America today who are continually caving to the pressures of this world because they don't know how to speak the truth in love. And so we've been silenced out of fear. And look at what Paul is saying. Let me read this again. We won't be tossed, verse 14, then we will no longer be immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. That is immature Christianity. Immature Christians are blown about by every new thing that comes. Oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try this. Mature believers have an ability by God's word to process through what they're enduring. They have an ability to process through that they're not blown about by every wind of new teaching. They will not be influenced when people try to trick them with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, what will they do? 
Instead, they will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Mature Christians know how to speak the truth in love. It is an immature Christian who caves to the societal pressures to champion things that violate who God is which actually violates our love for God. We don't have a choice to make. It's not either love God or love people. The whole message of Matthew 22, 34 through 40 is this. There are two great commandments. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one, he says, is equally important to the first one, love your neighbor as yourself. And Christians today are in a quandary. How do we do that? How do we love God and stand for the truth of his word and stand for what he has called us to be as believers and love our neighbors as ourselves? Can we just crawl into a hole, pull the covers over our head, and act like nothing exists and wait for God to come back and save us because we don't know how to deal with this? That is a quandary many Christians are in today. And what does Paul say? You must grow in your maturity because the maturing process of the Word of God allows you with wisdom to navigate. You know what? That's a new doctrine. That's a new thing. I don't need to be pulled in that direction. I'm going to stay steady on the Word of God. I'm going to stay steady on what He has for me. And we're going to stay focused here. And I am going to speak the truth in love. The truth in love says this. Listen, I can't go along with that. I can't be okay with that. Why? Because I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. It's not about being a holier-than-thou person. It's actually saying I'm not that great of a person, but I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and that love motivates me and constrains me that I can't go along with this. But I can still love you. I can still care for you. I don't have to beat you. And Christians must grow in their maturity to the point where they can live their life in such a way that they engage the community around them saying, I can't endorse that. I can't, that violates scripture. That, that, if I love God, I can't endorse that. But just because I can't endorse that doesn't mean I can't share water with you when you're in need. Doesn't mean I can't bring a meal to you when you're in the hospital sick. It doesn't mean that I can't somehow demonstrate love to you. Yes, the world is is change the definition of love, but Christianity is the basis of the definition of love, which is Jesus Christ sending and coming and dying for us on the cross while we were still sinners. And it is high time Christians redeem the love concept to say, you know what, we're not going to let unsaved people define it because they aren't the source of it. We're going to let Christ define it because he is the source of it. And this is what love looks like. I can't champion your cause. I can't endorse your cause. But that doesn't mean I'm trying to destroy you. That doesn't try to mean I'm trying to beat you. That doesn't mean I, I protest and burn your house down. It means when you're gone for a week and you can't get home, I mow your grass for you. It means when you're sick and in the hospital and you're, you're struggling, I can bring a meal over to you. Because it is the love of God that is motivating me. It's the love of God that is constraining me. And Christians have lost sight of the reality of God's word to be able to know how to live in the world today where they are being bombarded with the things they are being bombarded with. And it is a mature believer who says, you know what? By God's help, with God's word, I can process through this. And I can speak the truth, live the truth in love. Thus fulfilling the two great commandments. Love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. Love my neighbor as myself. It's not either or. Those are not mutually exclusive. Those are joined together, inseparably linked together. Satan has unhitched it, and believers have bought that. And it's time believers say, you know what? Let's hitch those back together. I can unconditionally love God and others simultaneously. It is time that believers demonstrate that to the world and community we live in to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word this morning. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom. We live in such difficult times. 
where we do not always know how to live and how to act and how to respond and what to do and what to say. Father, give us wisdom. Help us to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, in your power and in your strength. We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen.